Hello again everyone, this is 2.3, Analyzing Graphs of Functions. And in this section, we'll be talking about certain properties of graphs of functions. Uh, first, let's recall what a graph of a function is, what we saw from the last chapter, the last section, uh, 2.2. The graph of a function f of x is a plotting of the points x comma f of x. And the biggest thing to remember is that we always let y equals f of x. It's the y value of a point. So the visualization here is that if we have this curve that represents the graph of f, and we pick a particular x value, plot it, plot its uh, point that corresponds to that x value, its y value will be f of x. All right. Next, uh, we define zero. The zero of a function f of x is an x value such that f of x is zero. So what the point would correspond to, remember the points are of this form, x comma f of x. So the x value will be x and the y value will be f of x, which is zero for all of these zeros. Okay, so a zero is not the number zero, but it's a number that gives you zero when you plug it into the function. Okay, uh, here if we have this curve of f and these points here that I'm plotting, notice these points are just the x-intercepts, but they are of this form. They have y value zero. So we can actually say that f of x1 is equal to f of x2 is equal to f of x3 is equal to zero. So all of these values, f of these values are zero. So the numbers aren't zero. The numbers may be negative one, two, and three or something like that. But when you plug them into f, you get zero as a result. Good. Um, also, what's nice to see here is that these are just x-intercepts. So if you wanted to visually find the uh, zeros of a function, we can actually just graph the function and look for the x-intercepts. And the x-values of those x-intercepts are the zeros. So we'll see some examples of that right now. Um, yeah, let, let's, let's see what we have in store. Okay, so I've come up with these examples for finding zeros of a particular function f of x. So I'm labeling all of these functions as f of x, but it could be f of x, g of x, h of x, just whatever the name is. But yeah, they're f of x in this case. Um, how do we find the zeros? Well, we're going to basically find the x-intercepts. We're going to set f of x equal to zero and solve for x. So here, we want an x value such that 3x plus 18 is equal to zero. So let's see if we can do that. Subtract 18 to the other side, and then divide by 3. We get x is equal to negative 6. So this is a zero of the function. Because when you plug negative 6 in, you get zero as a result. The next one's going to be a little more challenging because we have to either factor and use a zero factor property, or we can use quadratic formula. I'm going to attempt to factor this. Let's see if we can uh, use our factoring skills. So I know it would have to be 2x and x, and then these two numbers would have to multiply to 30. I'm going to take advantage of the AC method. So if we recall the AC method, we look for two numbers and multiply to the product of A and C, which is this times this, so that's negative 60, and add to negative 7, the middle number. And the two numbers that do that are, hmm, let's see. It's not easy to see ahead of time, but let's see if we can do this. So I got 60 is equal to 1 times 60, 2 times 30, 3 times 20, 4 times 15, 5 times 12. And all I'm doing is looking for the difference of these numbers because we want them to add to negative 7 and we want them to multiply to negative 60 so the signs must be different, and when numbers have signs that are different, and you add them, you're really taking the difference. And notice here, the difference between 5 and 12 is 7. So the numbers that we're going to work with are 5 and 12. Now, um, fi 5 and 12 are not the numbers we're going to write here, though. So remember how that goes. We draw a line through this, 5 and 12 like this, and then the number in front, the first term without the square, 2x. So we're going to get 2x over 5 and 2x over 12. We need to get the signs correct, though. So it has to be negative 12 in order for them to combine to negative 7. So that's going to be 2x plus 5. And then after reducing this, we end up getting x over negative 6, so x minus 6. And we can check that this foils out correctly, but, um, but it does. You can check for yourself, but that's OK. Uh, now I'm going to erase some of this and use the zero factor property. Okay, so remember for the zero factor property, 
you change the signs of the other numbers that are next to x and divide by any number in front of x. So here, changing the sign for 5 will give you negative 5, and then dividing by the number in front of x, 2. Here, changing the sign of negative 6 gives you positive 6. So these are the zeros, which, by the way, is negative 2 and a half and 6. Okay, the next one's a little different as well. We want to find x values such that this fraction is 0. When is a fraction 0? Something we've actually seen a little bit before. I want to do a little more beyond finding the 0 here. I'm actually going to factor everything. Now notice factoring helped us here a lot. So maybe factoring this will help. Let's see. So if we factor the, well the top can't be factored. <laughs> the top is just x plus 3. The bottom you can actually pull out a 2. You get x squared minus 3. You can actually factor this over uh, irrational numbers. You can take it as a difference of squares. I know it sounds funny, but just kind of hear me out for a second. So this much is clear, I think, right off the bat. Now, remember, x, minus, x squared minus a number uh, squared is a difference of squares. It's x minus a number and x plus a number. So basically, we're going to square root each of these numbers, x squared and 3. When you square x squared, you get x. When you square root, well, when you square root x squared, you get x. When you square root 3, you get square root of 3, which is just radical 3, right? And the signs have to change. So one is negative and one is positive. This constitutes a difference of squares. If you foil it out, you'll exactly get this. So if you don't believe me, you can try it out. Um, but it's kind of funny because we don't really need to do this. I'm doing this for a different purpose. But notice a fraction is zero not when the bottom is zero. It's undefined when the bottom is zero. Remember that. A fraction is zero when the top is zero. And you can see this by cross multiplying because when you cross multiply, this whole expression that we just spent a little bit of time factoring, multiplied by zero is just zero. So after cross multiplying, we're going to get the zero equals to the numerator only. But an even better way of thinking of that is that a fraction is zero only when the top is zero. Okay? Then subtracting three gives us that x is equal to negative three. So that's our zero there. Okay. Um, so take a look at these answers here. I'm going to erase, but I'll keep the functions up. And then I'm going to look at graphs of the functions and then talk a little bit more about um, what happens when we take a look at the zeros. Also, I want to look at this, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that right now. So let me, uh, let me erase this and then we'll see that right now. Okay, so I've taken my time to graph each of these functions. And the first one is a line, the second one is a parabola, and the third one is some weird looking thing we haven't really seen before. We'll talk about that later. For right now, let's take a look at this line. Um, notice for all of these, they have x-intercepts, and the x-intercepts are exactly what we found for the, um, the zeros. So this zero here is x equals negative 6, and it makes sense that the x-intercept is negative 6 itself. Of course, the y-intercept is 18. Y-intercepts are actually really easy to find because they're just f of 0. If you think about it, x is 0 for the y-intercept. So when you let uh, x equals 0, you get 18, so it's pretty fair. It's a line because it's linear, so just find the zero and the y-intercept, plug in zero, and connect those with the line. Good. This next one is quadratic. Um, as it turns out, all quadratic functions have graphs that are parabolas. So this is a parabola, which is an opening up U-shape um, that we've seen in class, I think, once. Also, um, yeah, so every linear function has a graph that's a line, and every quadratic function has a graph that's a parabola. Good. Now, looking at the zeros, x equals negative 5 over 2 and x equals 6, we indeed get those as corresponding x-intercepts. Perfect. Now, um, of course, the y-intercept, if you plug in 0, it's negative 30. So I'm not really talking about too much of how I got the graph, but I'm just showing you that the zeros correspond to x-intercepts. And that's really the only big thing I want, that's a big takeaway I want to uh, say from this. There's something that's kind of interesting with this one though. So it only has one x-intercept, negative three. It has this weird shape though. And remember that a function, well, a graph of a function must pass the vertical line test. So for any vertical line, it does not cross the function more than once, okay? 
it looks like there's possible overlap for a uh, vertical line right here and right here. There's not though. So what we get instead are what are referred to as asymptotes. So we get this vertical line that the graph doesn't uh, intersect actually. It's kind of interesting. I hope that comes out okay on the screen there, but it's this red dotted line I'm trying to draw. And here as well, let me try to make it a little more bold. Now if you're curious, the graphs of, or the equations for these lines are x equals negative radical 3 and x equals positive radical 3. And that shouldn't come as too much of a shock because, remember how I factored here and I said that it doesn't constitute for any, well it doesn't um, have to do anything with the zeros, but it has to do kind of with something else. And this is what it has to do with, if you set the denominators equal to zero, you get where the function is undefined. So we can't plug in 3 or negative 3 because you get a zero denominator and that should correspond to something similar on the function. It's not in the domain of the function. So plugging it in will not result in a actual y value. So it's not an x value that's plotted as a point on the, um, on the graph of the function itself. Okay, so I want to talk now about a little more um, a little more about some other properties of functions. Right now we only really spoke about zeros, but I'm talking a little bit about domain here and uh, y-intercepts as well. But uh, next I want to talk about um, when a function goes up and goes down and then certain, um, certain properties from there. Okay, for these next properties of functions, I just want to discuss them visually. I'm not going to write down the actual definition using letters and yeah, and I'm not going to do it that way. Um, if you want, you can actually take a look at the book. It's on page 191. Well, 191 and 191, they discuss this in more of a definition style. Um, but I just want to go over the concept because all we really need is the visual concept, I think, here. And the visual concept for increasing, decreasing, and constant are basically just when the function is either going up, down, or no vertical change at all. So here, from negative infinity to this point, to this x value it seems, the function is decreasing. So from negative infinity to this value, let's call it a, we have a decreasing function. So what decreasing means is the y values get smaller and smaller. So as you go from left to right, it's going down. Let's call this x value b, and if we go from a to b, notice the function isn't going down but it's going up as we go from left to right. So since it goes up as you go from left to right, from A to B, in contrast to from negative infinity to A, this is actually increasing. So the function here is increasing. But what happens from B to infinity? Well, from B to infinity, the function is remaining constant. There is no vertical change. So I can possibly talk about uh, intervals of increase, decrease over here as well. But let me just write, um, let me write down here, as far as decreasing, increasing, and constant go, the intervals for which the, the function is decreasing, increasing, and constant are in interval notation, negative infinity to a, a to b, and b to infinity. Okay, But this the visualization is that as you go from left to right, the function is either going down, going up, or not going up or down, just remaining constant. Good. Now for max and mins, it's a little more intuitive, I think, but a max is just the highest point in a location, and a min is the lowest point in a certain location. I say in a certain location because there are what are called relative or local max and mins, and then there are maximum or I guess global max and mins. But Let's really only talk about, for right now anyways, the, um, the ones we can see in the local sense. So here, this is a max, this is a max, and this is a min. Now the reason why I say local or relative is because it is a max only in this closed region. There are points that are above this max, like this one here. So where this max is an absolute max, 
and this max is only local because this is the, the largest of the maxes, but this is still a max in its own right. It's a little weird, but again, if it's just the highest point in this region, it is a max. If it's the lowest point in this region, it's a min. Uh, this, by the way, is local because there are smaller points out there. There are points with smaller y values, namely over here and over here. The graph seems to go below the y value of this min. Okay. Uh, the next thing I guess I want to say is that notice if we're passing through a maximum, that means our function went up and then went down versus when we're passing by a minimum, our function went down and then is going up. So if I call these values a, b, so the x values that correspond to these points, a, b, and I guess c, then we see the following as far as uh, intervals of increase, decrease. So where is it increasing and where is it decreasing? Well, it is clearly increasing from negative infinity to A. Then it is decreasing from, so it goes up from negative infinity to A. And then it's going down from A to B. So from A to B it's decreasing. But hold on, as soon as we go from B to C, it starts increasing again. So let me just say comma B to C. And then from C to infinity, it seems to be going back down. So just some example relating this idea of increase, decrease to what a max and min is. So the last thing I want to talk about now is something to do with symmetry that we saw before, um, but more of it from a definition standpoint as far as what it, co what it corresponds to as far as a function is concerned. Okay, so the particular definitions I want to talk about for these properties are what are called even and odd functions. So I say here that an even function is a function such that f of negative x is equal to itself, where a function is odd if f of negative x is equal to negative that function. And I give some examples here. Let's see if we can figure out which ones are which. Um, by the way, these are called even and odd functions basically because that's what happens when you have powers that are either even or not. So if you think of like, just as a quick, quick example, negative two to the third, well, two to the third is eight, negative two to the third is negative two times negative two times negative two. So it's going to be negative because you have an odd amount of negatives. And then two times two times two is two to the third, which is eight. So negative two to the third is negative two to the third. So think of it like that. Whereas negative two to the fourth, let's say, an even power, you have an even amount of negatives, so it's positive, and this will be positive two to the uh, fourth. So kind of try to see what happens here, so maybe ignoring the negative eight part is a little easier to see. When you have uh, odd powers, a negative pops out. When you have even powers, a negative just goes away. So now let's see if we can see what happens here. So for this one, we want to see if this is even or odd. We're going to replace x in the function with negative x. And let's see what happens. So anywhere I see an x, I'm going to write negative x instead. Just like that. And what do we get? Well, remember, negative to an odd power, the negative comes out. So this is negative x to the third like this without parentheses. Here we get a double negative, which is positive. And notice you can actually factor a negative out and you get negative x cubed minus x. If you distribute this uh, negative back in, you'll clearly get negative x cubed plus x. And notice this right here is just f of x, meaning the whole thing is actually equal to negative f of x. So in reality, this is actually an odd function. What makes it a little easier to see is that its terms are only odd powers. So that's some key insight I kind of gave you over there. Here, the powers are only even. And we have this constant term, but as it turns out, you can write this as uh, 2 times x to the 0. 0 is even. And uh, this is actually um, an even function. So let's see that by replacing x with negative x. So notice all I'm doing here is replacing all of the x's with parentheses first and then filling each of those parentheses with negative x. Now what happens? Well, a negative to an even power, the negative goes away. 
So this is x to the sixth plus 3x squared plus 2, and that's back to f of x. In other words, this function is actually even. Okay, so why do we care about even and odd functions? Well, if you remember back from, I think it was 1.1, where we saw graphs of functions and certain properties of those, there's symmetry. And a graph of a function will have certain symmetry depending if the function is even or odd. So if the function is even, it has y-axis symmetry, where, so, um, rotating about, not rotating, but uh, reflecting about the y-axis will give you the same image on the other side, which makes sense because if this is an x-value, the y-value it corresponds to is f of x, and if it's indeed even, then negative that value should correspond to the same y-value. So that's the reason why they are actually um, well, that's the reason why even functions are actually uh, y-axis symmetry, have y-axis symmetry. For odd functions, very similarly, um, if you pick an x value, you'll get, projecting to the function, you'll get a certain uh, y value f of x. And if you pick negative that value, projecting to the function now, what you should get instead is negative that value you got otherwise. So really what this is, is what is called uh, origin symmetry. Symmetry about the origin was 180 symmetry, so if you rotate it 180 degrees, you get the same image. So this is, uh, let me just say, origin symmetry. Okay, and I believe that's the last thing I wanted to talk about yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to talk about as far as 2.3 is concerned. Really the biggest thing here was zeros because we'll be using that, um, that vocabulary a lot later on. Max, mins, increasing, decreasing don't come up too often. Even and odd will come up later, way, 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 way later on. Um, but at least I introduced in, uh, increasing, decreasing, and constant in this section because, uh, like I said, we won't really be seeing it too much later on, but it comes up a lot in calculus. So just... Introducing that idea here, I think, is, uh, is good because it kind of plants the seed, so to speak, for what will flourish into something very, very beautiful in that topic of math. But as far as, like, immediate things, zeros is what we kind of need for this class a lot. And even an odd will come up later. But in any, any event, that was 2.3. Hope you enjoyed the video. It was really, uh, really fun stuff there. And we'll move on to 2.4. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.